Hey, up. Right, changing the oil on your Royal Enfield Classic 350 or Meteor 350, as both bikes are mechanically the same. Now, making videos like this is a rite of passage, if you like, for any YouTube channel that does bikes. But it often opens up a can of worms over warranty. Now, I should bring your attention to the fact that Royal Enfield themselves nine months ago published a DIY tutorial on how to change the oil yourself and I'll leave a link to this video in the video description down below. Now there's no other way to look at this I take this as being the manufacturer of these motorcycles publicly expressing that they consider an oil change on these bikes to be an owner suitable maintenance task. So if you carry out this work yourself and you carry it out correctly as per their instructions, it should not in any way affect your manufacturer's warranty because they are the manufacturer. Now, I have been a little bit shocked in recent months uh, from some viewers that have bought these bikes. They've taken them down to the local Royal Enfield dealer to get the first service done and it's cost them 300 pounds or more in some cases which in my opinion is a bit over at the top for what is essentially a simple little commuter bike i know that the tappets should be adjusted at the first service and i know that royal enfield dealers do need to survive and they do rely quite heavily on service work but just to put this into perspective my 2019 mini clubman the first service was well under £200 and it's a far more complicated machine than these classics. And the servicing takes place at a BMW service centre, which ain't exactly cheap. So I'm struggling to see how some people are being charged that amount of money. I'm not saying that all Royal Enfield dealerships are charging that amount of money. Obviously, people only complain to me when they think there's something amiss. But if you don't want to do this task yourself and you want to have it done at your dealership, agree a price with your dealer before they undertake the work. Now, I've read the video description of this Royal Enfield video. There are no stated exclusions for particular territories or countries. So as far as I'm concerned, the information given in this video is intended to be for international use. So, having got that out of the way, I will not be entertaining any questions pertaining to the manufacturer's warranty in the comments section. Manufacturer's warranties are nice, but personally, I don't put an awful lot of importance on them. The 2015 Consumer Rights Act in the UK protects you against defects. Your contract is with the retailer of any product and that retailer is responsible for rectifying any defects with any product, not the manufacturer. You have no contract with the manufacturer. Yes, a warranty claim is always my first part of call, but if I get messed around, I don't mess around. I just go through the pre-litigation protocols and put a county court claim in and it's never failed me yet. Right, let's get on. Now, in this video, I'm also going to show you how to deactivate or switch off the service reminder icon on your LCD display. I was a little bit miffed when I realised that Royal Enfield had actually put this on this bike, but you don't need to take it into a dealer to switch it off. You can do it yourself, and it's very simple. And I'll show you how to do that at the end when we've done the oil change. Now, the oil change procedure that I'm going to show you in this video does differ slightly from the official Royal Enfield video. If in doubt, stick to what they tell you. First thing you need to do is start the engine up and allow the bike to run for a few minutes. You want to get the engine oil circulating through the engine and you want to warm it up very slightly. And while that's progressing, you're going to need a few things. First of all, two litres of 15 W50 semi-synthetic motor oil and that motor oil should meet the API SL grade specifications 
Jasso MA2. I prefer Silkaline, it's my brand of choice, you use whatever you like, although most Royal Enfield dealerships that I've visited seem to use it as well. You'll also need a new, genuine Royal Enfield oil filter for this model of motorcycle, and I would recommend that you pick up a set of spare seals. Now, you can get away with reusing seals, but you know, if it comes to the day where you do an oil change and you found that one of the seals is damaged or it's hardened up, potentially have a problem. So I would recommend having one of these kits from Hitchcock's on hand. They have, if you like, assembled a full oil change kit using genuine Royal Enfield parts that includes everything that you could possibly need for an oil change. At around £14 plus your oil is a no-brainer really. I'll leave a link for these items and the motor oil in the video description down below. Now, switch the engine off when the engine casings are slightly warm, not hot. This will make the oil just a little bit easier to drain. Now, the other reasons for running the engine are you need to take any particulate matter that's accumulated at the bottom of your sump and get it into suspension and mix it in with the oil so you get most of that gunge out of the engine when you change your oil. You're also ensuring that the moving parts at the top end of the engine are covered in oil because there may be a few seconds of oil starvation when you first start up after refilling and it will ensure that there is enough oil on your tappets your camshaft and your cam chain to make sure that it's well lubricated until the oil is pumped up to that section of the engine so when you're happy that the engine is warm enough switch it off and then leave everything to settle down for 10 or 15 minutes that will allow the bulk of the old engine oil to run back down into the sump ready for emptying First of all, remove the oil filler cap. This will allow the oil to flow out more easily when you're emptying it by allowing easy access for air to replace the volume of oil as it comes out. You don't get any glugging that way. You then need to turn your attention to the underneath of the engine. Now, the oil strainer cover is fastened in place with two 8mm hex bolts. I prefer to use a small quarter inch drive socket to remove these but you can use a ring spanner or an open ended spanner from your toolkit. Make sure that you have a suitable tray or container underneath this area to catch the used engine oil and carefully partially unfasten both bolts. Now the Classic 500 has a very similar setup underneath it and I've found the easiest way is to just partially unfasten them and then drop the plate down to allow the oil to escape. It just gets a bit complicated if you're trying to hold the cover in place while you're removing all the fasteners and then quickly get the plate out of the way. You end up with a right mess and I just found it easier, less stressful and less messy to do it this way. Leave this for about 15 or 20 minutes to drain and then turn your attention to the actual sump plug. By this time, most of the engine oil will have already drained from the engine. In the Royal Enfield video, they don't mention the sump plug, and I think they've taken a pragmatic approach to this, because actually removing the sump plug only releases about another 150 to 200 millilitres of oil. So this bit is optional, it's up to you whether you want to go to the trouble of doing this or not. Personally, I think it's worth it because I like to get as much of the old engine oil out as I possibly can. Now, it's a bit awkward to get at, which is probably why they've left it out of the video and decided to just drain the oil from the strainer plate. And you will need a 17mm open-ended spanner. Just loosen it off and then carefully remove it with your fingers, obviously making sure that you have that tray or container underneath ready to catch the oil. Now, the main reason I wanted to take this sump plug off was because I thought it would have a magnetic fitting in the end to capture any uh, sort of metal filings that are released from the engine during the running period. I was surprised to see that there isn't one, it's just a standard sump plug. Over the last few years, Royal Enfield engines have earned a reputation of being pretty much bomb-proof. 
And it looks like they've now got to the stage where they're confident enough in their engineering and manufacturing skills to leave the magnetic sump plug out of the equation. You can then go ahead and remove the strainer cover and the actual strainer itself. Now, the strainer itself is basically made of plastic with a metal mesh. And it's just an interference fit. It's actually held in place by a rubber O-ring. Royal Enfield recommend using a pair of round nose pliers to remove this strainer. And I've got to admit, I don't like that idea. With the housing being plastic, it's going to be very easy to cause damage to it. And you can just remove it with your fingers. It's not easy, but you can do it. And there's zero chance of you causing any damage to it. The strainer itself was actually pretty clean. I couldn't see any debris in there at all. But all these parts do require thorough cleaning before refitting. So put all of these parts safely to one side while we just remove the actual oil filter itself. And I'll show you how to go about cleaning them. The oil filter itself is an inboard type, just like on the old classic 500. And the cover is held in place with three 5mm Allen screws. Just go around and loosen them very slightly, and whilst you're doing so, hold the plate in place. It's spring-loaded, so if you just try to undo these fasteners without putting pressure on it, it'll sort of come out at all weird angles, and there's a possibility of straining or damaging threads, so put firm pressure on it to hold it in place while you remove all the screws. It's a good idea to wedge some workshop wipe or a rag or something like that between the brake lever and the engine casing just to soak up any drips that come down. It stops them getting under the engine and then uh, sort of revealing themselves a few days later and making you think you've got an oil leak. And make sure to thoroughly clean off any drips or runs immediately. Of course at this stage you can remove the old oil filter ready for disposal. Changing your oil is a messy job. You do get runs and drips everywhere and I would make sure if I was you that you have a clean-ish workshop wipe available at all times to deal with these as soon as they present themselves. I have over the years, especially as a youngster, spent days trying to, you know, sort of work out where a leak is coming from because I've got a very slow drip coming from the engine in certain parts only to find it was some sort of spill like this at the oil changing stage that i hadn't caught and of course for days afterwards it was just continuing to drop down until it ran out There's nothing more frustrating than trying to find the source of a non-existent leak now it's not essential but it's always good practice with this sort of filter to pre-soak it before installation the Paper filter material does resist oil uh, when it first encounters it. It needs to be sort of wetted out, which can cause a delay in the oil flowing through the filter and getting to the critical parts where it's needed once the engine has been started. As I say, it's not essential to do this, but it is good practice. Fill a container up with some new engine oil and then just plop the new engine filter into it and leave it to soak while you get on with cleaning those other parts ready for reinstallation. Now is the time to thoroughly clean all those components that you've removed from the bike before refitting them. There's no point doing an oil change and then just replacing all these components drenched with the old dirty engine oil. Give them a thorough wipe over to soak as much of the old engine oil as you possibly can with a workshop wipe or something similar. And then what I like to do is give everything a good blast with silkaline brick and chain cleaner. It's o-ring safe so you don't have to worry about it damaging any of the seals and it creates quite a high pressure that will clean out even dirt and debris that you can't see. It then takes about five minutes for it to evaporate so that it's safe to put back on the bike. Take the opportunity here to check all the seals, make sure that there's no damage to them and that they haven't hardened up, and change them if necessary. 
Over time, the high heat that these engines produce can cause these seals to harden up. Once they've hardened up, they're unlikely to seal effectively. And even if you do get them to seal, the next step is that they will start to crack and you'll get leaks. I certainly wouldn't reuse them any more than twice. Remove the new filter from its oil soak and just wipe off any excess, otherwise it's going to drip all over the place while you're fitting it. And then carefully press it onto the mounting part inside the filter aperture. It may require that you twist it a few times just to make sure that it locates onto that sort of spigot properly. You can then go ahead and refit your cover. Now, I found the all of the fasteners actually to be very positive for want of a better word. Sometimes with especially the older Royal Enfield bikes, the fasteners feel a bit sort of elastic and sometimes it's difficult to ascertain whether you've tightened them up correctly or not and sometimes that can lead to over tightening and stripping threads etc. Now I don't know whether it's down to different thread profiles or whether they're using a different type of alloy but I knew exactly where I was with every fastener on this engine. Remember to use firm pressure from your hand to maintain pressure on that spring and then just using your fingers insert every screw and screw it into its full extent. I actually found that I could do this until the thread effectively stopped. You can then go ahead and just nip them up with the Allen key. And once the thread bottoms out completely, 1 16th of a turn is all that's required to get an effective seal. And I found that to be the case with every fastener during this task. Very similar procedure for the oil strainer underneath. Again, make sure that you clean off any drips that might cause you problems later on. And then carefully refit the strainer, ensuring that it seats properly on the spigot inside. This is not spring loaded, but you can then go ahead and refit the cover and the two fasteners in exactly the same way that you saw with the main oil filter housing. Again, initially, just fasten them up finger tight and then no more than 1 16th or 1 8th of a turn using your socket. And to ensure that you don't over tighten these, hold the socket by the head, not by the handle. That cuts down the amount of leverage available to you and stops you going too hard on it. It's then time to refit your sump plug, not forgetting to put a new copper washer on it first. Again, clean the area thoroughly before refitting, and then fasten your sump plug back in finger tight only, as I've said. And just like the other threads that I encountered, this was a very positive thread. You were able to get it just about all the way in with your fingers, with minimal spanner pressure required to effect a good seal. Again, 1 16th to 1 8th of a turn only and it's now time to refill your engine oil now in their video royal enfield said to put 1.7 liters of oil into the engine it's possibly due to the fact that i drained that little bit of extra oil off from the sump plug but all in all i managed to get 1.85 liters in and even after a six mile test ride where the engine was well up to temperature, I would say there's probably room for another 50 milliliters, maybe 100 milliliters up to the maximum mark, but I'm not going to top it up to that just yet. You should be safe to just drop your first liter in without having to, uh, you know, check the actual levels. In fact, with the first liter, the oil won't even come up to the sight glass. 
I then put a further 500 milliliters or half a liter in, which brought the level up cold to sort of halfway between the maximum and minimum level. After that, I started the engine up, let it run for 30 seconds just to circulate it round the bike and fill the oil filter housing up. Switched the engine off, let it settle out again and added an additional sort of 350 milliliters, which brought it to just below the maximum level. Now, after I took the bike for a run, as I say, which was six or seven miles, even hot, it was about two thirds up between the maximum and minimum level. So it could take a little bit more, but my experience of uh, oil changes in the past, if you go ahead and fill it to the maximum level, quite often you can find later on that you've overfilled it so i'm going to leave it like that for now and then probably top it up after a couple of rides thoroughly wipe off any drips or spills and check for leaks both before and after riding the bike and it's always worth just checking the bike for a couple of days afterwards just to make sure that no leaks have suddenly sprung from any of the fasteners that you've disturbed and then you should be good to go until the next service interval Right, so let's have a look at how to reset the service warning icon on your LCD display. Now, at 279 miles, the little spanner icon denoting that the bike is due for a service started to flash. Obviously telling me that the first service, the 300 mile service, was imminent. I'm not a great fan of these things. I think they're distracting. And of course, a lot of them require a visit to your dealer, usually involving a fee or a fee for a service to have it reset, which, you know, it's my vehicle. I shouldn't have to pay to have their warning icon removed from my vehicle. Luckily, where Royal Enfield is concerned, this can be reset by the user and it's very easy. First of all, switch on your ignition. Then on the left hand side of your handlebars, there is a button marked I or information. This is your main menu button that allows you to toggle through the various displays on your LCD display. Now it will depend which screen you currently have displaying, but toggle through that button by repeatedly pressing it until you get to trip number two. And when you reach trip number two, hold the button down. This will reset the trip meter. Do not release the pressure on the information button from now on until this procedure is complete. Hold it down, pause for a few seconds, and then while still holding that button down, switch the ignition off. Then count 12 seconds. Now, technically, it should only be 10 seconds, but my experience of things like this, it can be a couple of seconds either way. So count to 12 seconds as accurately as you can, then switch the ignition back on while still keeping your finger on that button. Wait for a few seconds, and eventually, the spanner icon will stop flashing. You can now take your finger off the button. And that's basically all there is to it, quite simple and straightforward really. You've now effectively reset your service reminder until the next service is due. If for any reason it doesn't work, just repeat this procedure. Once again, thank you so much for watching this and my other videos in doing so, helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate it. I hope you found this video useful and you've enjoyed it and if you have please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. Now I will get on to checking and if necessary adjusting the tappets in due course. I've just got so much on at the moment I don't know whether I'm coming or going. As I said I will leave links in the video description down below for any of the products that I've used in this video. I am of course going to be back on Friday so until then please. Ride safely, and I'll see you soon.